Hi everyone, um, I'm Jason Bernagosi. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of digital media and animation at Alfred State College. I'm also one of the co-founders of a nonprofit media arts organization that deals with a lot of uh, old and sometimes obsolete uh, technologies for artists to come play with and work within a multidisciplinary context with tool makers and researchers uh, called Signal Culture, which is on my shirt here today. Uh, and I'm one of the three people with the digital to analog converter instruments. I'm the, one of the techies, so nice. Hi, uh, I'm Eric Seiler. Uh, was assistant, now associate professor of new media at Indiana University, South Bend. Also an artist and very much involved with signal culture as well. And my name is Laura McGough. I'm a media arts curator and a media art historian, and I am finishing up a PhD at the University of Buffalo. And I'm gonna kick things off today. Um, our research focused on exploring the potential of digital to analog television tuners as media tools for the manipulation and real-time modulation of the live television signal. And this is a converter, in case you're unfamiliar with the technology. This is actually the one that we hacked, a different, different model, or the same model, actually. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to begin by briefly defining the technology we're working with and then move on to discuss three different areas of inquiry that emerged from our research. Planned, ob planned obsolescence, digital divide, and visual rhetoric. And finally, I'll talk a bit about how our research fits into a media art historical genealogy of tool making, which is something that's very important to the three of us. Um, and then we'll talk about the process involved in hacking this device, the technical knowledge we gained, and we'll demo the device. And so a television tuner is a digital to analog converter device that allows analog television sets to receive over-the-air broadcast television programming without a cable or satellite box. As countries around the world transition from the analog to digital broadcast spectrum, television tuners enable individuals with older analog television sets to receive over-the-air digital broadcasts from local television stations. The devices allow for a simple signal conversion. They receive the digital television signal, which is then converted into an analog signal that can be received and displayed on an analog television set. The transition to digital television is a process that is taking place at, various, at a various pace in countries around the world as governments adopt new broadcast standards. Like analog television, digital television is transmitted via radio frequencies through terrestrial space, over airwaves in other words. But the key difference is that the digital television uses multiplex transmitters that allow multiple digital, digitally compressed channels to travel on a single frequency range to be split out later at the point of reception. That's how you receive all those multiple PBS and HBO and Showtime channels. <clears throat> The first digital television transitions occurred in Luxembourg and the Netherlands in 2006, with the United States switching to digital broadcasting in 2009. As a point of comparison, Argentina is scheduled to end all analog broadcasts in 2019, while Brazil's conversion should be completed by 2023. As digital ephemera then, television tuners occupy a particularly unique position. As the device is become an appropriate and necessary technology in one country, they are rendered virtually obsolete in those that have already undergone conversion as digital TV prices drop and citizens replace analog television sets with their digital counterparts, rendering TV tuners a technology whose obsolescence has been preordained. And there you can see the status of the DTV transition um, from 2015. So still a lot of countries to go. The Environmental Protection Agency does not track the number of individual television peripheral devices like digital to analog converters that make their way into landfill, but we do have general figures for all television peripheral devices from a December 2016 EPA report, which notes that in 2013, 940,000 tons of TV peripheral devices were discarded with an additional 920,000 tons disposed of in 2014. In both cases, less than 50% of the peripheral devices were estimated to be recycled. As mentioned next door, media theorist UC Perica has used the term zombie media to describe technologies planned for obsolescence. Zombie media, as he notes, signals death in the concrete sense of the real death of nature as their toxic chemicals and heavy metals continue to seep into the soil long after the devices have been discarded. 
The zombie media can also have another life, reanimated by artists and hackers into tools for expressive creation. In our research, we found that a useful outcome from our reanimation of TV tuners as a media art tool is that it allowed us to gain a better understanding of how a seemingly simple consumer device functions. By looking inside the TV tuner, under the hood, so to speak, we were able to reveal both circuitry and code and at least partially dis demystify this device, creating a first step that other artists, hackers, and tool makers can build upon. The process of peering inside not only um, the process of peering inside the device not only revealed its technological construction, but also its unique role as a socio-cultural object. Television tuners enact a relatively straightforward signal conversion, but embedded within this sim seemingly simple device is a complex history. Um, and they're objects that are illustrative of an invisible digital divide. We can track this divide back to the first digital television broadcast in the U.S., which took place on Sunday, November 1st, 1998, when ABC TV screened 101 Dalmatians to viewers in 20 cities across the U.S. Only those households which own digital television sets, which if you remember at the time were priced at $5,000 each, or who bought adapters for their analog television sets could see the program in the high quality digital format. 11 years later in 2009, the U.S. would shut off its analog TV broadcast for good. Individuals who received free analog broadcast television signals through antennas and who could not afford digital television sets and who wanted to continue receiving local television broadcast transmissions were required to purchase a television tuner or lose signal. In the U.S. alone, an estimated 73 billion analog television sets necessitated conversion. In response, Congress enacted a subsidy program in 2008 that targeted elderly, rural, and low-income citizens and offered up to two $40 government coupons per household to reduce the cost of approved television tuner devices, which at the time ranged in price from $40 to $80. Um, and I think it's also important to note that in addition to individual households, a range of other sites also required conversion, including nursing home, prisons, and public schools that were left out of that program. Um, the U.S. government earmarked $1.5 billion to the National Telecommunications and Information Administration Act of 2008 as part of this subsidy. And despite this payout, millions of households still weren't ready for the transition. As the Nielsen Company reported in 2009, more than half of the viewers from unready households were under the age of 35 and more likely to be minorities, low income, and were less likely to have internet access. Um, nonetheless, it was the elderly that became poster children for a population of population confused by the switchover. The talk show with Spike Fernstein produced a number of skits poking fun at the government information campaigns promoting the digital transition. Attention. Over the past year, we've been alerting you to the February 17, 2009 switchover from analog to digital television. This is an important update. Update? The Obama administration has requested nationwide postponement to the federally mandated conversion date. You've got to be kidding me. If you've already installed your new DTP box, you will now need to uninstall it in order to ensure there is no interruption in service. I haven't had TV for three weeks. Okay, so this clip is ridiculous, <laughs> but it does actually mirror our own experience. <laughs> um, early in the research process, when we first hooked up our converter to an analog television set, we received a weak signal warning over and over again um, as the converter box attempted to scan local broadcast channels. And despite all of our training as media makers, it took us a while to figure out what was going on, an embarrassingly long <laughs> while to figure out what's going on. Um, to receive a signal, we had to do three things. Move our workspace from a second floor space to a third floor space, right? The average person could move their apartment, right? <laughs> Up and down. Uh, we had to engage in creative placement of the antenna. And finally, we had to purchase an antenna preamplifier to boost the signal, which finally enabled clear reception of some local channels. So you can imagine the confusion uh, individuals without our knowledge um, encountered during this transition. As media artists, uh, media art historians, we were also particularly interested in the visual rhetoric or language of televisual spectatorship that was used to promote the digital transition. 
Documents touting the benefits of digital transition were generated by the Federal Communications Commission, lobby groups including the National Association for Broadcasters, um, and even a study guide was distributed by PBS to familiarize students with digital conversion. And these documents tend to characterize digital television as offering viewers distortion-free TV pictures, better resolution, and better picture and sound quality. Analog television, to the contrary, is defined as susceptible to distortion and interference. The characterization of digital television as distortion-free enacts what we saw as a sort of curious visual hegemony as the digital signal is framed as offering consumers a better viewing experience, not only technically, but also ideologically. As digital conversion, social studies, science, and language arts curriculum, the study guide created by McNeil Lehrer for PBS declares, it has been anticipated for years, television like we've never experienced it before. The end of picture ghosts and snow, raspy sound quality, and rabbit ear antenna, a bigger event than changing back from black and from changing from black and white to color. Television broadcasting that will be more dynamic and flexible, interactive and responsive to the needs and interests of the American people. The characterization of digital television as distortion free and X, um, oh, sorry about that. Um, in fact, digital television's reception is actually more prone to topographical interference than its analog counterpart, easily blocked by hills, trees, and buildings. The digital transmission remains distortion free until the signal weekends, glitching appears, we've all seen this, um, and then the system actually shuts down altogether. So you get the glitch and boom, it goes to black, right? It shuts down. To the contrary, as the analog signal becomes weaker, it doesn't shut down, but instead displays varying effects due to different kinds of interference. Snow, which we see here, which is radiated electromagnetic noise that is accidentally picked up by the antenna. Ghosting, which is when the image echoes or two separate signals are layered one on top of the other. And horizontal lines, which are randomly arranged scan lines that can be caused by nearby electronic household devices, like your microwave or refrigerator. Media theorist Wolfgang Ernst has reminded us that temporally disturbed images make us strain to see better. It is within these disruptions and breakdowns that we can more critically observe the nature of the medium itself. Unlike its digital counterpart, analog interference renders the broadcast signal visible in manifest ways, enabling the sort of subversive spectatorial experience that Ernst described, and the television tuners in part seek to place under erasure. And indeed, there are many ways to watch TV that fall outside of this perfect picture paradigm and are affected by new uses of technology as well as geography and topography. Writing in the Washington Post in 2016, Jeff Goh noted that he had started to watch television and films and fast forward. He originally did this for efficiency, there was just too much good television to watch, but found that speeding up video had, was more than an efficiency hack. Acceleration, he noted, made his viewing more pleasurable. He found sitcoms played at twice the speed to be funnier, and the faster pace made it easier to appreciate the flow of the plot and the structure of the scenes. Where the FCC, PBS, and others see distortion as an impediment to spectatorial pleasure, like Go, we see it as a condition of possibility, a site where the broadcast signal can be mined for its aesthetic and expressive qualities. Pioneering electronic media artists also saw the aesthetic possibility of distortion. Writing in 1961, video artist Namjoon Paik famously declared, the live transmission of the normal program is the most variable optical and semantical event in the 1960s. The beauty of a distorted Kennedy is different from the beauty of a football hero, but for Paik, there was beauty in both distortions. Artists like Paik purposely interfered with the analog television signal by placing magnets directly on TV sets or introducing oscillators or fans to the gallery environment to enhance electromagnetic interference. The results were a swirl of abstract images intended to force an awareness of the viewer's relationship to the televisual image. Magnets and fans were fine, but what Paint really wanted to accomplish was to make the video signal as malleable as paint, to shape the TV Kansas as precisely as Leonardo, as freely as Picasso, as colorfully as Renoir, as profoundly as Mondrian, as violently as Pollock, and as lyrically as Jasper Johns. In our field, that's an incredibly famous quote. <laughs> To achieve this, Pate constructed a number of video tools that enabled media artists to do what television engineers and producers and the various entities touting the digital conversion sought to avoid, to contaminate the video signal. 
These tools included the raster manipulation unit or wobulator, a prepared television which permits a wide variety of treatments to be performed on video images, the Pekka B synthesizer built with engineer Shu Yua B, constructed in 1969. The device was first used at WGBH Boston during a live experimental broadcast by Pake entitled Video Commune, Beatles from Beginning to End. Here's a still. <coughs> According to Pate, tools like the video synthesizer made for a tran tranquilizing, groovy TV, which he predicted will put an important function of future TV, will be an important function of future TV, like today's mood music on the radio. To increase accessibility to this new instrument, Pate published technical diagrams and agreed to assist in the creation of several duplicate models for WNET TV in New York, the California Institute of the Arts, and the Experimental Television Center in Binghamton, New York. In 1971, Pake installed the synthesizer in New York's Gallery Bonino so that gallery visits could play in front of the camera and manipulate the images. In this way, the audience became both the artist and content of the work. The spirit of open source hardware that Pake pioneered became something of a standard in the field. Dan Sandin, a visionary hardware hacker who um, made a video synthesizer in the early 1970s and published a complete tutorial on how to construct his image processor. And numerous other artists also went on to make video tools that pleasurably distorted the video signal, including Dave Jones, Bill Etra, Steve Rutt, and Stephen Beck. Take just a point back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with these pioneering video artists in mind, and a data maj Fabras as an offering, um, our research considers how television tuners might similarly be recovered as an artistic tool that further troubles the complex history of this device by reclaiming distortion and creating interference with the digital signal as it becomes analog. So I'm going to stop here and hand things over to Jason and Eric. Well, essentially, data machine is a way for you to uh, cause pi pixels to appear to rupture. There are, when you watch anything on YouTube, it's a process called long GOP compression, which means you have intracoded frames, which are actual real full frames of video, that have a series of predictive frames, or some people like to call them partial frames, that only show the change that happens in the video pixel. So they only write in what's different from the previous frame. When you have a data moshing process, though you uh, eliminate any future intracoded frames and you cause the, the uh, predictive frames to really smash into one another because they don't have a full frame of video to reference, they tend to blend together, smush, and you know we use the term moshing because it comes from uh, kind of punk and hardcore shows where people slam their bodies against one another. The pixels kind of slam into one another, creating very unusual, t uh, very bright, overly saturated colors and a type of smearing that's a very kind of painterly uh, look to it. Right, which we saw in the Bob Ross, that little Bob Ross. Yeah, event. you saw some of the Bob Ross um, with the live broadcasting that we're currently doing. Um, but what's, what's unique with what we're doing, uh, there's two ways you can do this. Um, one way is the hex editing, so you can get down to the level of the code of the video and actually start messing with uh, that in weird ways to create data modeling. Uh What we've been doing in the past eight years is actually trying to do signal interruption. And so we've done that through um, actually just streaming. So we found if we could stream the signal and then interrupt it at very specific moments, we could actually um, get it to data mosh. And that has led to um, this piece of software called Innerstream uh, that we developed for Signal Culture App Club that allows you to uh, data mosh in real time, which before really wasn't 
that possible. <laughs> so that's what data moshing, I mean, it's one thing to say it, this is what it looks like, um, but it's another thing to actually see it. Um, but not only can we excite the image, we can make it drift in very specific <laughs> Now, really, uh, this has been around since 2009, I think. Um, and a lot of artists have been using it, but a lot of artists, um, it hasn't really been a, uh, a real-time process uh, until uh, very recently. Um, yeah, it, it should be important to note that we're not the first ones to do uh, live camera data moshing. Uh, Tom Butterworth uh, did a version of it for Quartz Composer, but never kind of uh, made it to a fully fledged application. It was a very that was the low, same year I made mine. Yeah, the same year Eric made it. Very <laughs> it wasn't low very good, but it was, it was, it was it's very low resolution, but it, it was there. Uh, ours we can do full 1080p HD uh, data moshing uh, with multiple streams of it. Um, what, what's important about what why live and and part of the the philosophy of signal culture, but also the philosophy of what we like to do is that when you have live real-time processes that react uh, the minute you change something, it fundamentally changes the way you think and the way you make decisions. Uh, the difference between that and the old hex editing version, which you know Takashi Murata was known for doing back in 2005, is that with the hex editing, you have to kind of predetermine what's going to go into what, and maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't. When you predetermine that, you have to sit and you have to wait, it renders out, and then you get something. But when it happens in real time, you can uh, have thousands of permutations, thousands of ways to orient yourself, and you, in a lot of ways you share the creative process with the machine which is uh, what I think is, is a lot more interesting. You kind of augment your expectations and your human logic systems in order to, to, to think uh, a little bit differently and to get to new aesthetic territories. Well, I think it's a dialogue. It becomes a dialogue at that point uh, with, yeah, with, the, it, with the machine, so it's its own agency. So I kind of, that was somewhat of the background process to why we wanted to um, hack um, a hardware-based data moshing. Uh, and so we, we opened up the uh, digital TV tuners, and the first thing uh, that we had to do was identify a lot of the components. And this was a, a challenging process that actually was quite interesting because a lot of the components we looked up, uh, like the micro uh, processor that handles video, we found when we did our Google searches, it was like, oh, here's a DVD player, here's a TV. So they're like these mass components um, that goes into lots of different electronics. Um, and it was kind of daunting at first. There's about 10 pages of this. This is all the components that's on the micro, on the board uh, for the digital TV tuner. Um, and that, that was kind of the very first day, it was just like trying to orient ourselves inside of the black box. And the second day um, was, we talked to Dave Jones, which Jason, yeah, D Dave Jones is kind of a, uh, Laura mentioned it briefly, he's kind of this legendary uh, video synthesizer tool maker. He's still making new uh, video and audio uh, modules for Eurorack synthesizers. Um, and he's been doing stuff, here's a picture of him with some of the video freaks, he's right right about there. Uh, and today uh, he still has a studio in Owego, New York, which is not too far from Sydney Culture. Uh, Dave is kind of this technical guru, he kind of... Uh, Self-taught, self you know, um, completely. Uh, started hanging out in Amsterdam, working with uh, a lot of uh, major musicians like Alice Cooper and the like, uh, doing early, early, early video with them uh, in 1971 and 72, eventually making synthesizers for the Experimental Television Center. Uh, because uh, there were certain, you know, as artists, we have a lot of questions about technology. We like to poke at it, but sometimes we need some answers as well. So working with Dave is a really important part of that process. Uh, I've also been working with Dave uh, on the reconstruction of the Wobulator, which is the device that uh, Laura was talking about that Nam June Paik made. So we have this long history of him being the engineer as the artist, I ask naive questions and he says, that's not possible until I ask the right naive question. He goes, whoa, maybe that's possible. And we go forward from there. And the biggest thing we wanted to ask Dave was how to hook up uh, these devices to our computer uh, via serial connection. 
And so that was the second day. Um, here's all the different boxes. And so Dave had to hook these machines up and figure out their baud rate so we could connect to them uh, via serial port. Um, and also helped us uh, figure out how to where to solder and get things in. And Jason might be more able to talk to this. Yeah, so essentially, you know, when you have serial ports, we you know, actually many of you uh, may not know, you know, USB is a universal serial bus, right? Um, and we used to have RS-232 serial ports on a lot of our computers. Some PC people still have that. Uh, the the t style of serial port that's actually available on a lot of these boards for testing is an RS-232 style port, but it doesn't have the same voltages. They tend to have a lower voltages uh, to, to work with those devices. So we actually have a UART serial uh, connection, which we soldered in. You can see on the right uh, image there, uh, where, where we have our, our, our plus uh, minus three volts uh, signals, our ground, and our power. Uh, and using on the left uh, kind of a, a UART uh, converter uh, where we can take that uh, UART uh, standard, bring it up to RS-232, then use an RS-232 to USB connection. And uh, with the baud rate, it's about 115,200 uh, in order to bring that up in our terminal program uh, to be able to see what actually kind of the, the device starts to spit out. Uh, through that process, we actually realized that uh, we worked with RCA boxes, Zenith boxes. The device that was actually the most open and easiest to start hacking was uh, the digital stream device, which is the cheapest one that you could get from Radio Shack. Thank you, Radio Shack. It made it a lot, <laughs> lot easier to kind of uh, parse out the 100 and... Well, well, was we, it? we got each one to spit out serial, but it's all proprietary, so it's all... And the, even if digital stream is the most open, it's still giving me 10, over 10,000 uh, function calls uh, for the code. Uh, and it, it's it's uh, this US OS2, uh, you can see there it says on the kernel, um, which was, was very daunting. So I essentially, as an artist, I, I, this was somewhat my role in the group was trying to do the, the coding part, the component, and um, was to kind of look through the, all of this code and I was doing uh, very purposeful uh, searches. So like, here, okay, how do we auto scan? So searching for scan of channels, channel up. But also trying to look for language that could potentially uh, create data moshing, uh, which we'll talk about here in a bit. Yeah. Um, this is somewhat mirrors uh, Laura's presentation, uh, but uh, it was very hard to find a, a channel <laughs> and uh, a rule upstate New York. Um, but that kind of illustrates what we had to go through to hook this thing up to actually get it to work in a rural area. Um, so day four, um, here we are, artists, we've opened up these boxes. And the first thing I start doing is just tapping with my finger on this thing. It's like, oh wow, it works. Like I can see the data moshing happening. And I'm like, well, what can we get to vibrate faster and move faster than my hand? And so our first inclination was to use a toothbrush. And what I'm vibrating or rubbing uh, is where the signal actually comes in. Yeah. Um, and and, and, and that, that, that's being put onto the antenna port. You know, uh, the antenna port is going to have a, a wide series of inductor coils, and those inductor coils are, once you take the shield off, they are uh, very vulnerable to uh, various types of vibrations. And Electromagnetic. Then, yeah, electromagnetic vibrations. And what's interesting about that is, you know, the reason we bring up the wobulator earlier is that the way the wobulator works is that you feed in a series of low-frequency electromagnetic vibrations onto additional coils that create an electromagnetic disturbance that's much lower frequency rate than it normally needs to keep a full uh, raster rate on the television. And so this idea that low frequencies, t you know, uh, tend to actually um, do better at deconstructing the image was something that we found consistently, whether uh, it's, it's through using sound waves or using toothbrushes, uh, you know, to, to manipulate that signal. We talked how interesting it would be to use vibrators, but we didn't go there. Um, 
<laughs> one, one problem you see here in day four, though, as I scan through, uh, we see weak signal come up. And that was a big thing uh, for me as the, pro uh, the programmer on this, uh, was to try to fix that. And we'll get to that here in a bit. Also, uh, other experiments we did uh, was the pins, and Jason can cover the hardware section. Yeah, so you know, essentially we had a series of, of two sets of major pins that we could actually have access to. Because most of the stuff is surface mount uh, components that are being put onto the, it's onto the board and seeing where the traces are going, we found that using uh, areas of the pins where the antenna was uh, soldered on were a lot easier for us to access without possibly blowing the entire unit. Uh, so that we had a five pin uh, uh, enter and an eight pin um, uh, exit uh, for the antenna. And initially uh, we just kind of played around a little bit. We found some interesting combinations uh, where we were uh, introducing various types of resistances and capacitors to those pins. Uh, we found out later that uh, you know, pins uh, one through five were uh, primarily for, uh, the pin one was audio, uh, pin two and three were the plus minus five volt system, pin four was a 3.3, .3, and pin five carried the video signal. Uh, the other uh, pins uh, for the e exit were uh, doing some various things. We actually found that pin seven and eight, which is the, is the important part, uh, we're seeing at first it was more, more like a, a floating signal. We couldn't really, it seemed so weak, we didn't realize that it was actually a very, very fast uh, 44.6 megahertz signal uh, that, um, you know, its rate was about uh, 22.4 nanoseconds, and it was a differential signal. So uh, essentially, one, when one's positive, one's negative, and it keeps the timing uh, for the, the, the tuner to, uh, to essentially being timing with the digital packets that are coming in. That allowed us uh, essentially to be able to start doing a timing system to manipulate that uh, digital signal uh, overall. So um, <clears throat> some of the things that we're, we're going to see here were the early experiments. Uh, a lot of what we ended up doing with those early experiments we didn't end up keeping, uh, mainly because they, they were uh, only available not through the composite output, but only through uh, the, the kind of traditional uh, F cable uh, output. And since most we really didn't think we would be able to show the F cable because I thought it was called B projection, uh, we, we stuck to more composite uh, manipulations. But if you move forward to some of the manipulations we were able to get with that, we were able to get some pretty strange uh, combinations, these kind of types of ghostings that were pushed across. That uh, mainly happened not only because uh, the signal was overloading, but we were actually uh, sending a five plus minus five volt signal into the the, uh, the video inputs uh, and, and kind of messing up the, the video as it's going into that antenna. And so that's why we also got these kind of strange ghostings and blowing out of the image. That's more kind of akin to traditional analog, but combined with the digital aesthetic as well, which I found kind of interesting. I think that's, that is one of the interesting things, is, is we're no, notating the visual phenomena that happens as we're doing different circuit bands. Uh, I think we went through all the resistors in your little box mm -hmm. and just, just started notating what, what happens at different resistances. Um, day four, um, I was doing a lot of the micro CS OS and um, while they were working over at Signal Culture, I went over to Dave's. It's like, Dave, help me understand this. This is this isn't like uh, for me. Uh, I know Java. I, I, I think I know how to code. But when I, I was a, uh, given this system that's completely proprietary and spitting out all of this nonsense, um, I was so frustrated. I'm like, I have to get the Sigmon to stop. The Sigmon Signal Monitor. That's what it was. sounds like a Digimon at first, but. Sigmon is actually the signal monitor that periodically checks if the signal is good or bad. And if it's bad, it goes to weak signal and it has a series of steps that actually we can kind of see in this code. No, you can't see that. Um, but basically it resets the TV, it turns off the TV, it turns off the audio, and then tries to sync it all and start back up again. Um, so I was, I was so frustrated uh, and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna say stop. 
And I said stop and it worked, but it, <laughs> it stopped the entire television. But that allowed us to track down a subtask, a subroutine, uh, which was app pause sigmon uh, task. And we were able to shut down the signal monitor, which allows us to basically do whatever we want to hardware wise without hitting a weak signal. So we can data mosh freely without uh, losing signal. Oh, there we go. I, th I thought I had, here's the bad video readout. And that was a real significant discovery. If he hadn't figured that out, um, our presentation would have stopped right now. <laughs> yeah, so it says here's the audio retry, retry, stop audio, sync. Um, and then we, what else were we doing that day? Once we got that going, I think this is just us playing with the pins again. Oh, we, we found some other different things too, though. Some different rolling, some different noises through the pins. Yep. Jason. Yeah, and, and you know, in order to make the, the pins easier to get to, of course, we, we soldered in some, some leads for it to start breadboarding and, and uh, putting that together just to see what each of the pins do. Like I said, ultimately, we ended up cutting a lot of that off be, uh, for the presentation. Uh, I think they're uh, because they're not necessarily going to work with the composite output the same way they would work with the uh, the, the, the cable output, the BNC. Um, I'm going to go forward. Um, some of the other things that were interesting, though, uh, with the micro COS hacking, we found some video freeze, to, uh, told it to stop decoding. We actually got this really interesting. Uh, image display. We're not really quite sure what the function of that was. Well, you can try that if, if you want. Do you have serial open? I do. I, I want to. We we got it running <laughs> well right now. So it does pause the TV and then crashes it. So, but it does create that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, let's go on. Oh, the Bob Ross. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, what ended up happening? You know, kind of going forward away from some of these types of setups is that the last time I worked with Dave Jones, uh, we realized, when I mentioned we had that 44.6 megahertz differential signal, that the best way to be able to manipulate that was to actually um, go ahead and figure out the very, very specific resistances that would, that would best uh, allow us to insert a square wave, uh, which is essentially a pulse, right? Uh, pulsing in order to get a more timed system versus just it's on or it's off. Can we make it more variable? Can it be like a video instrument? And and that's really kind of where we ended up going with it because things are interesting when you hack them and they happen, but can it be something that's variable, can be used by artists, not just a, as an effect, but they can actually bring things in over time. They can turn up knobs and you get more data motion or less. Uh, we, we found was that pretty much... Uh, yeah, we can get a timed response using a 16K uh, resistor into a 50K potentiometer range. Uh, and uh, and that, the essential we ended up getting was this. So um, right now, turn this down a little bit. This is what you would see on his machine at the moment, but we're going to demonstrate the system. Um, so there are tiny manipulations that, that happen at a certain time frequency. So the, the square waves are kind of pulse, 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 pulse. Uh, I can turn them up or turn them down. And as I increase the frequency, we can see that um, it begins to uh, pulse faster. And because of that, we can actually get to the point where it pulses extremely fast. And we, we get this kind of constant uh, data mosh uh, aesthetic. Uh, and so the idea of being able to bring it up and bring it down uh, is, is not an insignificant uh, task. We did find that uh, square waves were the ideal waveform, uh, mainly because when things are ramping up or ramping down, it's hard to see the difference. So we, you know, we tried sine waves and, and triangle and, and sawtooth. They didn't really work the same way. So square waves were uh, the ideal for this. Uh, in addition to that, uh, because we found that pin one uh, does carry the audio, uh, we did find that the audio can undo the image, 
which if you think about that as kind of a gestural, artistic kind of statement about this, you know, especially if you have newscasters whose voices are tearing their own image apart, right? Uh, you, that is another way to uh, bring that in. Now, technically how we're doing this, I have a square wave generator on my computer, I have a mini cable, and I just use some alligator clips to bring it into my potentiometer and putting it right into uh, the, uh, the pins on the board itself. Um, with, the, with the audio though, most audio that you hear is much higher frequency, and so one of the things that we came up with and we're going to do next as a part of this as an instrument is to work with that audio on an envelope follower. Which if you're not familiar with an envelope fo follower is, uh, you can have audio, you can speak in a microphone, and it will uh, take the amplitude of that and convert it into some sort of waveform. And so when we use an envelope follower to do uh, much lower frequency waveforms based on audio, it can be a type of kind of self-reflexive system you know, where Donald Trump or someone we don't like is on CNN talking and kind of, you know, it, he interrupts himself, his own visual and his own audio. Uh, we like that kind of creative potential uh, of that. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, why, why is this interesting? And I, I think that, that that's the other question. Um, you know, I, I think that when we look at what data moshing is and what it, what it may mean to data mosh something, it is uh, in many ways similar to what Nanjun Pike was doing with the Wobulator. The reason I like to keep bringing this up is that the Wobulator's main function was to show that despite casual observations, right, that the, the monumental authority of the television signal is in fact a fragile and impermanent uh, that's uh, sub subjected to a lot of variances. And, uh, and, and people have the power to see that signal kind of fall apart. That th it changes their relationship to it. Uh, data moshing, I've always maintained, is, is the digital answer to what Nanju Pike was doing with the Wobulator, showing these streams as kind of these incomplete constructions that are, that are being put out there. Uh, it's not just an effect for effect's sake. These processes carry metaphor with them, which we, we, we kind of talk about decay, we talk about instability, but we also, when we see this, we talk about how things are not truly autonomous. When you see a fully data moshed image, a lot of what you're looking at is colors that are emerging based on the relationship of what came before, right? So when you have colors slamming onto colors, slamming onto colors, those forms are informing one another in much more of a kind of a dynamic system. Uh, so, you know, we've done a lot of data moshing works that, that kind of address this, that uh, data moshing almost reveals the, the kind of uh, relationship of discrete frames as more of a part of a whole. Um, it also has a subversive quality, and I, th I, think, I think that that's, that's also uh, kind of interesting. Uh, and um, unlike a lot of other types of video synthesizers that are out there, uh, data motion has the potential uh, to to really get at the materiality of video, which it's intangible, but it is material. Okay, we've got to maintain that waveforms are real. We've you know we, we look at the 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 the, uh, <laughs> the issue of, of pe people you know yeah. about where where their perspectives are. And you know, always seeing that you know, if it's not something that they can see, does it exist? We know that right now, our bodies have all these kinds of uh, microorganisms that are constantly battling. Just because we don't have that perspective, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, with waveforms, at the same time, these waveforms uh, shape our world in more ways than we know. Whether we talk about it through science, we talk about it through art, uh, and, and getting people to understand the kind of hidden frequencies that exist that may control things, right? Uh, I think that there, there's some interesting considerations to go with that. Um, so it's an interesting uh, beginning. Uh, where I would like to see this go, um, you know, Eric and I, we've developed a lot of software data motion that I think is a lot more dynamic thus far. The part of the issue of, of working with these devices is that they are surface mount and and really, they're they're built to be very uh, to not be hackable, and 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 so we, we're kind of running uphill and, and trying to figure out new ways to, to mess up some poor engineer's uh, baby, 
but I think uh, where we'd like to go is to make it more fluid of a process. Uh, you know, make, make the pixels rupture a little bit more in the way that you saw with the the data machine through our app. But I, it's also I want to point out that uh, Eric and I have been working with this idea of a live real time data machine app. Uh, that could take a live signal for many years. We developed other methods, but we could never figure that out. It wasn't actually until we started working on this project that we're at where we realized that, well, okay, well, we're actually messing with how the feed comes in, that we were able to replicate that. And like how many, it was like eight years we worked on that live data motion thing. I had this idea after playing with this unit, I call Eric up, I'm like, get on the computer. We'd 11 o'clock at night. 11 o'clock at night, we FaceTime. And within 20 minutes, we had it working. We had it working, and it, and and so the metaphors do carry over uh, in, in many different ways. And so sometimes through that kind of creative reimagining of, of a of a unit, uh, other types of uh, unexpected uh, little successes can come up. Sure. Yeah. So I think I think it's interesting. That a lot of the things Jason brought up in relationship to to a lot of the new materialists. Um, research that's going on, and we've been reading. Uh, is this even going through uh, Karen Berard's book, uh, "Meeting the Universe Halfway"? Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting connections between uh, vibrations that we found here and the vibrations uh, she's talking about in her book. Um, one other thing I'd like to find, uh, just bring up, and I think it relates to Jason, and then I'll be done. Um, actually. We were talking about uh, fragileness and uh, fragileness of code. And so I started looking on uh, websites to see what fragile code came up with. And there's a, I don't really know the programmer's name, but his name's Vertex, Vortex 5. <laughs> and uh, he says, uh, code uh, that is hard to service, modify, or improve without introducing many bugs is what fragile code is. And fragile code tends to rely on too many assumptions that quickly become no longer true as features are added. And I think that's a beautiful metaphor um, for why we're doing this, um, that we're adding bugs so the assumptions of media and how it's used can be explored, I guess. Yeah. So we want to leave a little bit of time for questions, obviously. Yeah. Um,